call is from? Barrett Brown. An inmate at a federal prison. Hey, man. Yo. Now that this is all so close to being over, what are you most looking forward to? I mean, uh, playing video games. <laughs> Based on how things went early on, uh, you know, and the prospect of a lot of a lot of prison time sort of tend to shut down emotionally, and it's hard to get that kickstarted again. With Trump elected, you're coming out into a very different world now, right? With Trump, I, I'm kind of optimistic in the way you might be optimistic before a war, in that there's a chance that after all the war that's, that's inevitable, some needed changes might arise. But all these enemies I've made are still out there, and I'm still subject to these gusts of lawlessness. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm planning on getting out as, as a relatively free person. Uh, somebody's telling me I have to go now. Go. I gotta hang up the phone. I'm not. I can't talk to the press anymore. Hi, <laughs> I'm Barry Brown again. This is part three of a three-part series on why I'm angry with the FBI. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a case of the giggles. Uh, what Barrett did was essentially what journalists do all the time, which is take information that may have been stolen or leaked and used it to do investigative journalism that is in the public interest. Barrett is a journalist, he's a satirist. His work has appeared in The Guardian, Vanity Fair, he's published a couple of books. He had founded a collaborative web publication called Project PM. The purpose of Project PM was to bring people together to conduct research on publicly available materials that were put into the public sphere by whistleblowers, hackers, and such. Back in this country tonight, NBC News has been given an exclusive look inside the secretive organization known as Anonymous. When we break laws, we do so in the service of civil disobedience. We do so ethically. We do it against targets who have asked for it. Barrett was very aggressive in his reporting. He was provocative uh, in the way that he spoke. Barrett was accused of taking a link that was already public and sharing it in a chat room with other investigative journalists and activists. The files uh, contained revelations about close and perhaps inappropriate ties between government security agencies and private contractors. The problem was that among the millions of files that were dumped, there was data containing credit cards and security codes. No one ever argued, and there was no proof ever, that Barrett ever used a credit card. The chat record shows that he reposted the link to the Project PM um, channel and then immediately said, what was in that? The FBI searched Barrett's apartment and after they went over to his mom's house, the government alleged that she conspired with Barrett to hide his laptops. She was actually prosecuted and she pled guilty to a misdemeanor obstruction charge. If you think of the one thing that could actually get Barrett Brown to snap, it might actually be going after his mother. And so he makes this YouTube video. Uh, my mom is being threatened with obstruction of justice charges. Any armed officials of the US government, particularly the FBI, they know that I'm armed. And uh, I will shoot all of them and kill them if they come and, and do anything. Frankly, you know, it was pretty obvious I was going to be dead before I was 40 or so. so. I think the internet threats really gave them an excuse to go after him and, and arrest him. He um, has had a problem with heroin, and I think he was taking Suboxone to try to deal with that, and then he sort of went cold turkey um, and stopped taking all of that at the time when he issued these threats. So there really is some medical research that backs up the idea that when you do that, it's problematic, and sometimes you 
um, can be manic. He was kind of out of his mind at the time. I am. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to have the breakfast taco with with flour tortilla and um, scrambled eggs and bacon and cheese. One scrambled egg? Yeah. I'm going to do the burrito. Uh -huh. uh, could I get the eggs, potato, and chorizo? Sure. Thanks. Okay. You said he'll have some boxes, but not very many. You mean for like books and stuff? Or? Yeah, he's bringing home a box of things. Well, I know he'll be happy about his boots. He loved those boots. Well, all we know is that he's scheduled to be released at 9 a.m. We're so excited. Then we have to have him checked in at the halfway house near Dallas um, by 4 p.m. today. We brought his favorite outfit for him to change into. He wears a uniform of blazer with a blue and white striped Oxford shirt every single day. It's his uniform. He doesn't feel comfortable unless he's in his little uniform. We're just excited to get him out. It's been a long, horrible ordeal, and uh... Hey, son. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Oh, honey, look at you. I haven't been in a car in a long time. I'm already car sick. Oh, oh, oh that, that's right. We already car sick. Barrett, this may be a stupid question, but is this the first time you've been out in a town, or do you guys did you guys ever get out? Not without shackles on and a bus. I mean, we, we on the way over here from uh, Oklahoma City from the transfer center. You know, we did a ten-hour bus ride with uh, belly shackles, uh, so we got to see as driving in. We got to see some of these same sights. But, uh, that's the only time. I haven't seen any. Uh, yeah, other than that, I haven't for four years I haven't seen a town or anything of that nature. This isn't a very good one to start in. <laughs> about 15 pounds. I know all of his belts are gonna to be too little. Yeah. I mean, too big. I gotta use the bathroom real quick. Hope he's okay. We're, we're using up a lot of our travel time. Yeah. Okay, guys.
Is that cigarette that just, you know. That cigarette help. didn't help. I know, I'm sure it didn't. But I decided to have it. There is a little mm. Coke in that bag, too. Yeah, that's all, thank you. I got the ginger ale open. And there, there's some little pretzels, some. No, my stomach's fine now. I'm just, now I'm just, I'm just exhausted from the adventures. From the adventures? <laughs> all the fucking cops and fucking. Store clerks are barely deputized as cops, it looks like. <laughs> they probably all have a communication system they're using. <laughs> now they're now they're buying a milkshake. <laughs> you know, what are they gonna fucking what are they gonna do with the milkshake? Are they gonna commit a crime important? with the milkshake? Are they gonna cross state lines with the milkshake? <laughs> I had, I had covered a little bit. I had actually one of the first articles I wrote as a journalist was about the Texas Department of Corrections and uh, how they had tried to cut off access by journalists, uh, ironically enough. Uh, after a rape case came to light where two prison guards had raped a woman, and the first thing the Texas Board of uh, Corrections did was they passed that new regulation making it harder for journalists to interview inmates. They, they didn't pass a regulation making it easier for inmates to report rapes by their prisoners. They didn't do anything about that. So over the four years, it was a gradual revelation of how bad things are. But I mean, that was my, where I really emotionally finally began to understand. You know, I, I could never have made my case to the same extent that they made my case for me. The, the DOJ is presented eventually with a question that it won't answer, but the point is to ask the question publicly. The question being, is this typical of a federal uh, case? Is this, is this how our justice system works? Or is it unusual? And if it is unusual, why is it unusual? Barrett is an unusual criminal defendant. Barrett is an activist, and he is a journalist, and he is an intellectual. And so I think it was an intellectually honest approach that he took, which was, you know, I've done things wrong. I, I threatened an FBI agent when I shouldn't have. I recognize this, that, that, that that was inappropriate. But at the same time, he wasn't saying, you know, everything I've done is wrong and, uh, you know, I disavow the work that I've been doing. He, he, he didn't and doesn't. So I, I think that was, that was a little bit unusual from the government's perspective. Barrett faced a great deal of time. The government wanted to essentially throw the kitchen sink at him. The estimate uh, by mainstream media was 105, 106 years. But eventually, 11 of those charges were dropped by the government. Barrett's reposting of the link to that data was used to enhance his sentence, even though the charges that related to that conduct had been dismissed by the government earlier. This case is problematic, I think, for journalists and researchers and academics because what Barrett was doing really was a journalistic endeavor. My case is very helpful in illustrating all of these aspects across the board, from, from, from investigations to grand juries to, to sentencing enhancements and uh, everything else. It's, it's, it's a jackpot case for reformers if they use it. They had already started on me before I arrived, and I, you know, I really tried to live that when I got to that prison, but they had already, on my way from Fort Worth, they had already started calling over and saying, oh, he's a, he's a hacker, he's a, he's a journalist, 
And I was a pretty high status inmate simply because you know, I had taken on the DOJ and FBI. And you know, I was in the shoe at Fort Worth when I wrote those first three for The Intercept, hand wrote them and then to mail to the editors. And the editors typed them out. I actually learned about my National Magazine Award when I come out of the shoe. Journalists have slowly learned over the past six or eight years that uh, a lot of the rights that they thought they had, uh, they actually don't. In fact, the Obama administration has prosecuted more leakers and whistleblowers than all other administrations combined. It looks like uh, the days are about to get even darker. Uh, Donald Trump, as a presidential candidate, uh, was the most hostile uh, candidate to press freedom in modern history. I know that Trump probably does not hate anything more than he hates the media. It does absolutely worry me what will happen to the state of the free press in the United States broadly. Now that the Trump is sort of singling out journalists more and more, uh, when, when Trump starts threatening the real establishment journalists, the, 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 the worthless journalists who happen to hold these positions, and they start getting their, uh, their little their, uh, perks threatened, you're going to see more of a response to point to this and say, hey, you know, this, this is what's been coming for a while. We've been talking about it. Uh, you guys really let it happen. You know, and, and now it's time to start uh, talking about how we ended. So, Barry, can you just, in just a general terms, of what your game plan is now that you're out? What do you, what do you plan to be doing? I'm going to make sure that all of the elements of the case uh, gets put into a single package, a very charming package that will be distributed and paid attention to. And, get some attention on to these matters uh, in a way that can't be ignored. Are you concerned that you may end up right back where you just came from? Uh, it's a possibility. Oh! Sorry. Seven tenths of a mile. Very strong possibility. We should be there. Is this it? No. No, it's a lumber yard. I thought it was right on this... There it is. Turn right onto Carpenter Road, and the destination is on your left. Four, four. Right All right, love you. Love you. I'll see you. All right, I'll see you. Uh, see you tomorrow, whatever. Very well. Very well. I'll grab that bag out of there. Which one? I go now to a slightly better place. Close it.